President Xi tells the Chinese people to clean their plates in an effort to reduce food waste. Plus, we take a look at how India and countries in Africa are dealing with threats to food security. Hello, I'm Mike Waller, sitting in for Anand Naidu, and this is The Heat. China is putting diners on notice as part of a new anti-food waste campaign. We'll get to that in just a bit. But first, we take a look at middle-income countries like India and nations in Africa, where food insecurity has been made worse by the coronavirus pandemic. I spoke with Swati Narayan, an activist with the Right to Food campaign in Mumbai, India, and Nikla Kla Sehume. He's a journalist and news anchor based in Johannesburg, South Africa. I asked him about the impact of COVID-19 on a continent reeling from acute food insecurity. Well, in, the, in, in sub-Saharan Africa, including areas or the region of, which includes country like, countries like South Africa, Zambia, uh, Swaziland, Lesotho, and Botswana, we have found a situation where uh, even before this pandemic, the region was facing a very severe drought, and things have been made worse by this COVID-19 pandemic and the ensuing problems that have come with it. Uh, in response, there have been a number of measures. I can speak specifically to South Africa, where government has launched various measures, including providing food parcels to many of the people in the population to try and ensure that they are at least met halfway, even as they deal with the economic consequences or the dire consequences uh, which involve the COVID-19 and the resulting effects of it. Swati, uh, let me ask you about India, because it's got a dichotomy in a sense in that it's uh, one of the world's largest food producers and yet home to so many people who are going hungry, including uh, one third of the world's malnourished children. So give us an idea. I imagine with the pandemic, things are even worse. Absolutely. And we've had this problem of hunger amidst plenty for several decades now. Right now, we're in a situation of extreme hunger and poverty. Um, from the very first day of the lockdown, we had an unprecedented situation of 30 million migrants or more migrating from urban cities where they found themselves stranded without food, going back to their villages. And now those in villages, in rural areas, are skipping meals. They're eating less. Um, we have never seen such a situation. And as a middle-income country with resources, it's clearly a problem of distribution. Starvation deaths have also increased across the country. And a five-year-old girl succumbed last week. Oh, dire situation there. Uh, let's head back to Johannesburg. I've got a quick question for you. The United Nations Conference on Trade and Development from 2016 to 2018 came out with some figures that were really pretty alarming. Africa importing 85% of its food. That's a $35 billion tab. They say by 2025, it's going to grow to about $110 billion. Despite the uh, continent's resources, what more can be done to make uh, some of these nations more self-sufficient, do you think? Well, for a government like South Africa, which has uh, made a very uh, deliberate effort to try and respond effectively to this uh, COVID-19 pandemic and uh, the ensuing uh, economic impact of it, a number of measures have been put in place, including a, a, an economic uh, stimulus package of some 500 billion rand. However, this has also been met with its own problems in the sense of money being looted from this fund and uh, problems including uh, the, the corrupt activity which have somewhat marred the response from the government. Uh, it's, it's, quite, uh, it's, it's very important to note that government has since responded, putting on a very tough stance, saying that it will tackle the corruption that comes uh, with money that's literally being stolen uh, from the poor. This is money that's meant to, amongst others, uh, provide for people, including uh, the country's indigent in the form of food parcels. So just to give an ex example, uh, the South African government, along with uh, other NGOs, have uh, seen or rather distributed uh, more than one million uh, food parcels. But the problem here is that uh, some of these food parcels, which are meant for the poor, end up in the wrong hands. People are alleging that politically linked uh, of officials or people are the ones who are 
who end up getting these food parcels instead of them going to the countries most poor, the people that need the most. You look at a country like South Africa with a population of uh, some 50 million or, or more, uh, it, 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 it's quite, I mean, it's a drop in the ocean, but still, here's money that's being put aside, but it's, it's still not uh, being used effectively. Um, and Claw and Claw, I've got to ask you about Howard Buffett. I interviewed him a couple of years ago. He's the son of Warren Buffett. He spent a lot of time on the continent traveling around trying to address this issue. Um, and one of the things he says is that, that, you know, you can't use Western thinking to solve African problems. And he said one of the greatest failures from the West and from organizations like the United Nations, the World Bank, is that basically they, they failed to listen. So if, if they were to listen to the people in the continent, uh, what might they hear and how might they address some of these pressing issues? Well, for uh, many of the countries in this region, uh, there is this uh, new idea that says that we want to be more self-sustainable. We are not looking to uh, be too dependent on aid coming from Western nations. However, as mentioned a short while ago, uh, even as uh, South Africans, or rather uh, Af many of these African countries try and find solutions of their own, there are still systemic problems that still continue to, pre to prevail, uh, top among these being corruption. You see, uh, in a sense, it takes us uh, 10 steps backwards as we try and find solutions to our own problems when we still find systemic issues that still remain very prevalent, especially issues that also implicate uh, the, the, very, the very same government. I mean, we had the president of the ANC and leader of, uh, the, of South Africa, uh, Mr. Cyril Ramaphosa, sending a letter to members of his own party accusing the party of being accused number one when it comes to the issue of corruption in this country. If the head of state criticizes his own party for actions which are taken, uh, which basically set us back, it, it, it leaves really much to be desired. And Swati, let's talk a little bit more about India because you mentioned the migrants, which is obviously a serious problem, but farmers also have kind of taken it on the chin because like so many countries, there was a lockdown, they can't get out in the field, they can't, the supply chains are impacted. Talk to us about that and what can be done to help them. Exactly. So we have one of the most stringent lockdowns in the world, uh, according to Oxford University. Public transport has still not reopened. Um, and in, the, in this ridiculous situation, I think what we have done is imported Western concepts uh, to a middle-income country, uh, which is not exactly practical. Uh, even concepts like physical distancing is very difficult in a population with high population density. Um, the, on the positive side, however, farmers actually have, have done a wonderful job, and we expect a bumper harvest in November. So it is now a problem of distribution of this bumper harvest and food crops uh, to families which are on the edge. What the lockdown has done is exacerbated inequalities of caste, class, and gender. And the government policies, strangely, have increased inequality rather than reducing inequality. So we have one million fair price shops, and the government has given food grains to families from them. But 60% of our families have these ration cards to get those food grains, and they have doubled the quantum available for them. But the 40% who do not have these ration cards have got nothing. So um, I think the government needs to rethink its strategy very clearly, and we do not need such a stringent lockdown. And Claude, Claude I, I saw you nodding your head. I suspect a lot of the same problems are, are prevalent there on the, on the African continent. Social distancing also a major issue when you get congested uh, groups of people together. Um, is this also something that, uh, that you're seeing there as well? One doesn't have to look far to see issues regarding social distancing, especially when, I mean, there, there is a scheme currently where about 350 rand is being uh, provided to uh, unemployed people, to people who are uh, the most indigent in our country, which is the equivalent of about, uh, I'd say about $20. At various points at which these payments are being made, you look at the long lines that, that exist there, little if no uh, social or social distancing, and people not observing strict protocols which have been set out by government. Uh, it's quite uh, very important to note that uh, South Africa is among countries that have taken a very uh, strict stance or very tough a lockdown which has uh, gradually eased from a level five being the most strict to now a level two. And level two of the 
lockdown has seen many of the rules literally being broken, where people are uh, just not adhering to uh, strict protocols which have been set out by government, uh, and people taking a more laxed approach, especially when it, when it comes to uh, issues of hygiene. Uh, some of the talk that you hear in public circles is where people say, well, I don't know anybody who's been infected with COVID-19, so I guess the pandemic no longer exists in this country, which is the wrong approach as we are still living with this pandemic and have seen quite a number of people succumbing to this disease. And you've talked about so many issues there, uh, but one of the things we haven't talked about is the locust outbreaks, uh, which have been extraordinary. Uh, is there anything to be done in terms of that uh, problem as well? Indeed it is, and it's, it's proving quite a headache for a lot of uh, our farmers who have already had to contend with a severe drought. And now you have a, a, a locust outbreak that's also uh, eating away at, uh, at their crops. Um, but uh, there, there are some farmers who are trying to find innovative ways to respond to this, whether it's uh, using more effective pesticides, which uh, some may argue is still not y yielding the kind of results we want to see. But many are also within the farming, uh, the farming sector are calling for aid from government, are calling for help from government, saying we have suffered quite a bit uh, under this lockdown, and we've suffered even before this pandemic uh, broke out. And they are seeing little if no assistance uh, coming for them in, in that sector. And this is a very critical sector if one has to think about it. I mean, this is a sector that literally puts a, a food on the plate of many South Africans. And if it suffers, uh, one can only imagine uh, how our households are having a very difficult time, especially accessing uh, that proper nutrition that's required. Swati, I'm going to give you the last word. Obviously, uh, you're very active in this. Uh, talk to me about NGOs and the role of activists in this. I imagine there's a lot of sleepless nights when you look at something this big. Uh, but but what, are, what, what are some of the roles there? We have no choice but to be active because the government is not fulfilling its responsibility. We, for years, have put pressure in order to ensure that we have a Food Security Act and an Employment Guarantee Act. But both of these acts, which are the lifeline right now for people to survive, are not being implemented or expanded. So the number one demand that we have is every single person be given a ration card so that they can buy cheap food grains. And also, as he said in South Africa, that they be given cash grants or an unemployment grant to people who cannot work. And lastly, I think it's particularly important for children because school meals have been stopped completely, and children are the most vulnerable, and, they, and their brains could be damaged with food deficiency. So school meals need to be restarted, including giving them eggs and poultry products so that farmers can therefore be supported. Well, um, I think government need to rethink their strategy so that we as activists do not need to step in and do their jobs. They have a responsibility to their citizens. And that was Swati Narayan and Nakwa Kwa Sehume uh, joining us earlier. Turning to China now, let's talk a little bit more about what's happening there. Um, there's some food for thought. Uh, authorities there are cracking down on food waste as uh, flooding at home and tensions abroad threaten food security. There's lots to discuss. Let's get straight to our panel right now. Joining us from Arlington, Virginia is Chenghua Wu. She's the executive director at the Professional Association for China's Environment. Holly Wong is a professor of agricultural economics at Purdue University. She's joining us from West Lafayette, Indiana, and with us from Beijing, Einar Tangen. He's a political and economic affairs commentator. I want to welcome all of you to the show. And Holly, why don't I begin with you? Because it's so interesting, you know, when you talk to, uh, in Kwa Kwa, he's talking about drought on the African continent. Uh, and in China, it's, it's an entirely different problem. We're seeing severe flooding in southern China, and it's really uh, wreaking havoc on the uh, agriculture uh, industry in many respects. Talk to us a little bit about that. Uh, hi. Yes, you're right that this year there's a severe flood in many uh, southern Chinese provinces that affect the agriculture a lot. Uh, but so far, most of the loss are from the properties, from cities, and uh, the good news is the Chinese reported the summer harvest, which is a good year, even higher harvest than last year. So China usually have two crops in a year. Uh, so the summer crops have already harvested. And this came in the time that uh, affect the beginning of the fall crop. 
and uh, they still have time to recover, like replant. Uh, and also, the flood is only in the south side of China, and the north side actually enjoy more of the uh, rainfalls, and so maybe it's northern crops, like a corn and soybeans, can have a better crop. So we'll have to see what the fall crop would come out later in the season, but overall, people are very cautious about the damage in agriculture. They're taking every measure to take care of that. And Holly, as you well know, uh, last year, the uh African swine fever wiped out almost 40% of uh, the of poultry, I mean the pork industry, and uh, right now they're saying that we're seeing cases cropping up as a result of the flooding. How big a concern is that? Yes, uh, African swine fever uh, happened a, a year ago, more than a year ago. It really wiped out almost almost 50 percent of the Chinese uh, hog inventory that had a big flow on Chinese pork market, and people see the high prices and the uh, low supplies. And it's re the recovery is pretty slow for now. And uh, although we don't see that uh, the direct connect between that and the flood, though, but definitely it's something uh, pretty bad. China is still on the recovery, and uh, and the Chinese people now are learning to substitute some of its pork by other means, and also China is trying to import more uh, pork and, and from other countries in the world. Chenghua, uh, this uh, new campaign to uh, combat food waste uh, is not the first go-round. Uh, this also happened back in 2013. Uh, talk to us about this year's campaign and why it's so important. Uh, I think COVID-19 uh, has also taught the country some lessons or sent some alarms. And even though, relatively speaking, China seemed to be in a better situation compared to many other parts of the world in terms of uh, this year, 2020, food security, but in the big midterm, longer term, that remains a risk. Uh, so, uh, you know, there are a few things happening. Globally, I think we have additional 130 million people falling into poverty this year, just 2020. Uh, making the global total 820 million uh, people in hunger. And secondly, uh, you know, a dozen countries came out in the last few months basically announcing ban on exporting uh, particular crops or grains. And China relies heavily, actually, on more and more so, actually, on the international market to help meet its domestic uh, food security. And thirdly, flooding, as we we're talking about here, even though, uh, again, relatively speaking, China seems to be not felt the big pain, but uh, we don't know. Uh, I think there's tremendous uncertainty, and climate change is intensifying. Uh, so, uh, you know, food security for China remains a ri at risk. So, in the context like that, and China has to respond very strategically and very practically. Uh, so, food waste happens to be, a, you know, low-cost, easy thing to do. So, about a month ago, Chinese President Xi Jinping came out basically calling for a national com campaign to prevent, to control and prevent food waste. The reason is that China, it turns out that China wastes a tremendous amount of its food. 38% of its food production actually wasted. And a couple of years ago, I think the number was about 18 million tons of food wasted actually in China in that single year. So that remains a challenge that also offers the opportunity for China to respond to food security. That is why, you know, the country now today looking into what the opportunities or intervention points to do that. So a public funded uh, 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 banquets, as you mentioned, that, that that was the first round of campaign, and back in 2013, we still we need still need to make progress. Secondly, 80% uh, of food waste happened actually at restaurant dining, and that's tremendous sort of waste amount. And also schools, school lunch boxes, one third of the school lunch boxes were literally dumped. So those are the opportunities identified by the decision makers that for this round of campaign. Uh, to really trying to deep dive and trying to figure out how to solve the puzzle. That is where China today, I'm hoping somehow, you know, by preventing uh, food waste, China will be able, you know, to be able in a better, even better situation in terms of dealing with its food security. And Einer, uh, this really is a serious problem. The BBC says uh, so much is wasted that you could actually feed 30 to 50 billion people uh, in the world. Uh, it, that's a, a rather, st million people, I should say, a rather staggering number. It's a serious problem. How do you turn it around? Well, I mean, for China, the, you know, the leadership is trying to be the adult in the room. I mean, uh, food prices have gone up 10 percent. That's a, a very practical issue. Pork prices, as I said earlier, up 86 percent this year. And um, what they're trying to do is make sure they can make do with less. As you pointed out, uh, food waste is a, a massive problem. And it, it's linked culturally. I mean, when you 
invite somebody out to dinner, you cannot be skimpy in the number of dishes. Generally, the rule is you order as many dishes as people and maybe plus one. They've instituted a policy where they say, please, do it the other way around, as many people as you have, and one less dish, so N minus one. So this can have a tremendous impact. I mean, um, people are very aware of the hardships of the people around them. Uh, people are still very connected to the rural areas. And so they understand that th these things are very important. So you can expect this uh, to be p uh, part of that. But also on a global scale, I mean, uh, in what, 76 of the low and middle income uh, countries, it's expected that uh, food insecurity, poverty, uh, access to food will uh, amount to 22% over this next year. Uh, which is an increase of 2% over the existing 20%. So this goal that the United Nations had of uh, trying to eradicate uh, food insecurity by 2030 instead of going forward is slipping backwards. Uh, Holly, I, I was noticing while Einer was talking that you were nodding your head up and down. I mean, I've gone to, to meals with friends in uh, Beijing, and uh, you kind of roll yourself out of the restaurant. They always order uh, more food. It, it is really kind of a cultural thing. How do you turn that around? Uh, I think uh, consumers do have an incentive, economic incentives of not wasting money, but this cultural, like uh, one host order for the, all the dishes for the group, then there's a lot of uh, information asymmetry. He doesn't know how much people can eat and how much people do need, right? So I think we need some innovative uh, in the management on the uh, food service sector. So like whether it should be uh, each person, uh, the dish should be individually served instead of a group served, or uh, the size of the dishes. So anyway, it's not just mobilizing people, giving them more willing to save the food, but also the system should provide the so-called technology and for them to be able to do so. But anyway, every bit count. So for China, that has 1.4 million people, and 50% of them are urban, citizens and so to raise everybody's awareness of this food waste is a first step to go. And Chengwu, uh, the president, she's actually been out in front on this. He went to Jilin province, uh, met with farmers talking about food security. How important was his visit last month in terms of putting this out there in front of everybody to think about? It's always a symbolic. It's very important to have head of state actually go into the field, the meeting with the farmers, trying to convey the message that, right? And that's, that visit was broadcast everywhere. So uh, the, his speeches, what he said, uh, the message was sent very, very clearly. It's more like a real life situation that you know the attention, highest level attention paid actually to preventing a food waste uh, challenge actually in China today. Uh, I want to also add a couple of things actually by you know for the debate there. I think pricing uh, is another issue should be brought into the attention for the decision making process or the policy incentives there, right? If you look at uh, the pricing, you know, Holly mentioned the incentives, I think pricing of food by taking into consideration of real cost, you, you know, uh, of food that needs to be considered in the policy making process. I know it, it could potentially trigger some social stability or concerns in the society, but somehow in order to do so secure food security that needs to happen. The second element I really want to emphasize that they, you know, by if we waste the food, what does that mean? It's not just the food dumped. You know, if you look at what's behind this food produced, it's about water, it's about energy, it's about the chemicals, right? Fertilizers, pesticides. If you add those elements up together, it basically the case is so simple and clear. It doesn't make any sense, actually. It's not really responsible for any individual to waste any food in reality at all. I think that sort of messages need to be conveyed very, very clearly uh, throughout the society by different stakeholders, the individual household, so that we'll be able to really deliver the agenda set by the national government. And Holly, uh, we were just talking about prices there. Uh, corn, uh, the prices there are soaring. There are concerns about shortages there as well. Can you talk to us a little bit about corn? Uh, in China, uh, this year, I heard that uh, the corn price is not oh, very high. Then uh, actually, the government was trying to auction some of the corn out of its inventory. Then there were a few times nobody was buying them. Uh, so I guess they still have a lot of uh, inventory in the storage. And the uh, international market, now the corn price is not very high. Uh, so I guess in that market, right now it is OK. We got to look and see uh, what will happen in the future, uh, I mean, in the fall.
Einer, I want to talk a little bit about an article that was in the South China Morning Post. I'm going to read from it here. Uh, it's, quote, uh, concerns about food scarcity has recently surfaced, resurfaced in China, but they're not really about supply shortages of rice, wheat, and corn. Instead, they stem from the uncertainty uh, that China's prospects, what it perceives as an increasingly hostile word, uh, world, rather, which kind of indicates uh, this, this trade war, the friction with the United States. How much of that is an issue? It well, it issue. is an That's issue. I mean, uh, traditional areas like the United States and um, uh, other, uh, other areas, uh, Australia, etc., uh, you know, the, the relationships, frankly, are, are not going in the right direction. So, you know, this, there's this kind of overall concern. What happens next? Will we be stranded? But that's probably not going to be the case. You have uh, bread baskets in South America, whether it's Brazil, Chile, uh, Argentina, but it's by beef, wheat, soy, wine, fruit, et cetera, who are more than willing to step in, especially during very harsh times uh, for them, uh, where food is, uh, while it's a rising commodity, is, is something where they do need markets. Uh, but there's, this, there's also this kind of bias now emerging. 63% of, of um, Chinese are not very in favor of uh, American goods, and that's going to have a long-term effect. So you're seeing a kind of change in the supply lines uh, that's happening, uh, both because of this physical reality of food, but also the geopolitical attitudes of countries as they uh, do battle. And Holly, I know you wanted to jump in there, too. Uh, did you have more to add? Uh, no, I mean... Yes, uh, uh, the trade war has a big impact on Chinese uh, government because uh, they know that even though it's a small percentage, but the volume is big, that they rely on the import of the grains. And with the political uncertainty with countries, and, uh, and they need to have a reliable source of uh, corn and soybean imports. And Chengwa, you know, you and I have talked in the past about climate change, and, and you kind of alluded to that as well. How much does that factor into all of this? And do you think that that's going to create more awareness uh, for people who, uh, when it comes to this sort of thing? As you mentioned, you know, water, land, all of this contributes, and, and it's very important as we look at climate change. Absolutely. I think if you look at the numbers, and the food waste globally uh, accounts about 7% of the global greenhouse gases emissions, right? And if you put that in the ranking of the countries, is the world the third largest emitter, literally, you know, after China and the U.S., and uh, so the, the carbon embedded in the food production, the whole process is huge. And uh, so food, uh, food waste is not just saying you save the food, uh, but rather it's sort of the, the nexus of many, many elements into it, right? And there are numbers basically saying, you know, uh, the food, we, we waste about 1.3 billion tons of food every year globally. And uh, if you look at, say, how much water wasted is about 70 million uh, standard Olympic game pools. Yeah. That's yeah. the amount of water, right? If you yeah. do the land degradation, yeah. you know, there's more and more deforestation happening there. Right. So it, it's, it's a nexus of all the challenges sure. together that needs to be addressed. All right. Well, thank you so much. I want to thank our panelists. And that is it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Mike Walter in Washington, D.C. Thanks so much for watching.